Hello and welcome to yet another video and in this video it is another compact camera video because I'll be talking about this camera right here it's the Canon PowerShot G16 now this camera has been out for almost a decade now actually by this August it'll be about a decade old since this camera was released because right now it's actually May and yes it's very different compared to the very first um, Canon G1 that I actually talked about in the previous compact camera video and I'm still on this journey of exploring different older cameras you know using them traveling with them and actually just you know have them in my camera bag as part of the cameras that I'm actually taking and this camera pretty much was the end of the line like um, before Canon started you know continuing or committing to the G1X line, G3X, G, well G3X is kind of dead, G5X, G7X line and G9X line and things like that and it came out pretty much one year after this camera right here, which is the original G1X, which is my personal favorite compact camera, which I'll talk about in the next video. <laughs> But yeah, for now, I'll be talking about this G16 right here, which is another camera that I personally really enjoy. And of course, it's not a full in-depth review, it's just about my thought on this camera. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So the Canon PowerShot G16, now this camera despite being out for almost a decade now, in a few months it will actually be 10 years old, but anyway, um, this camera, it is still a very capable camera that actually if you use it properly, it will give you really nice results and it will also give you many manual controls over so many functions as well, so it's actually a very capable camera and also it is a very small camera that actually fits into a lot of pockets as well, so yeah, it is something that you, know, you might want to consider, especially at this price point of around 100 euros, so you can't really go wrong with a compact camera if you're really into the market of a compact camera for about a hundred euros and you need raw recording and also some other manual features that you want to control the camera with. Now this camera is indeed kind of out of date but in the same time it still delivers really nice quality as I mentioned earlier but I will also be discussing the pros and the cons later in the video and just like all of my other my thought videos on different cameras in this video it's not a full in-depth review video of this camera it's just pretty much me talking or actually sharing my thoughts with you guys about this camera based on how I shot with it based on my experience with it and what I think it's pros and cons of it so in this video I'll be dividing into three different sections as usual the first one is the ergonomics and the usability and then following by the image quality for both photography and video and then into my conclusion so let's first start with the ergonomics and the usability of this camera well this camera is actually a very small camera in my opinion at least I really love holding it this camera it does feel like a soap bar but in the same time it does feel very nice in hand I really love the finishing how you know the matte finishing here is and everything sometimes it does feel a little bit plasticky but in the same time it's kind of like a solid plasticky feeling if that makes sense that being said there is a feature that they actually remove from this camera that I really don't like and I really wish that they would actually kept it on this particular camera which is the articulating screen. Now Canon has always been known to you know um, removing and adding back the feature on this particular line of cameras since the G1. So the G1 actually came with a um, and like a fully articulating screen believe it or not and also the uh, the G1X that was introduced one year before this camera also came with the um, fully articulating oh my god it does feel much better than the G1 but anyway <laughs> well it did come with the fully articulating screen so yeah that's really good and it's something that I really wish that Canon would continue with a G16 obviously they removed it with a G15 and everything but in the same time it really is such a shame because it is a very capable camera of course I guess that they were actually trying to differentiate between the G16 and the G1X line of cameras at this point but in the same time it's such a shame though because this camera is a very nice camera to operate with and even if they were to add in like a fully articulating screen onto this camera I feel that it would still create that enough differentiation between this camera and the G1X that they would still make the profit out of the G1X because that is really a real professional compact camera at the time with a bigger sensor and also a bit more manual control as well as producing much better image quality out of that camera as well. That being said, this camera does have some features that the G1X doesn't have. For example, the Wi-Fi feature that I really love and also 
the ability to shoot in 60 frames per second in full HD. Now, of course, I haven't really shot anything serious with this camera, but it's always good to actually have it. And if you guys can actually, you know, find it more useful, then, you know, it's always there should you need it to. And also this camera has a much better focal length, in my opinion, because it goes all the way from 28 to 140. Whereas with the G1X, it starts from 28 all the way to 112. Yeah, that's an emergency uh, number here in Northern Europe. But anyway, moving on. And also this one has a brighter lens as well. And it starts at around f1.8 all the way to f2.8. So yeah, a lot of things on this camera, on paper, it's just much better than the other camera, well, much better than the G1X and certainly much better than the uh, G1 that I originally talked about in the previous video. But yeah, there would still be enough differentiation, especially from the image quality side, from that bigger sensor and more detailed sensor with two megapixel higher resolution as well. You know, this camera is still indeed a great camera and also I really love how fast this camera is. So it actually is able to shoot at around 12.2 frames per second for about six frames <laughs> before slowing down to about 9.3 frames per second but it will be able to shoot at 9.3 frames per second for about 500 images so that is something that's really is nice and you know you can really shoot a lot with this that being said the af point on here well the af system rather is actually not too sensitive so if you're shooting especially in low light you might want to be careful with that and also even though it shoots at 9.3 frames per second um, the autofocusing system might not always keep up to that. So also just watch out for that as well, depending on the subject that you're actually shooting in. But otherwise for like daily shooting, let's say if you're actually just traveling to another city, another country or things like that, and you just want to capture some landmarks, capture some, you know, some basic movement, things like that, then this camera is more than capable to actually focus and take pictures of those scenarios. And while we're talking about frames per second, I would like to actually briefly touch upon the shutter speed of this camera. This camera actually goes up to 4,000th of a second, which is actually pretty good. Of course, it's kind of standard, but hey, I just came from the G1 and also the G1X, which is also standard, but like the G1 actually only goes up to 1,000th of a second. And you know, sometimes when you're using bright lenses, well, that one actually also has a 2.5 um, aperture lens. And sometimes you just want to shoot over 1,000th of a second and it's very limiting. But anyway, it just felt very nice to have that 4,000th of a second. Of course, I would actually prefer the 8,000th of a second as standards on like most DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. But hey, you know, 4,000th of a second is still pretty good. Um, on to another point, this camera actually has a built-in ND filter. So yeah, but it's actually inside the lens itself. So yeah, it's actually a very convenient feature to have. And if you want to actually slow down the um, shutter speed a little bit while working with such bright light condition, things like that, then you can actually use the ND filter. So yeah, that's good. Now I have to be honest with you guys, I haven't really used this camera in a very serious manner. So I never really take it out to like a professional shoot and shot with it. I've only traveled with this camera. So when I tried out the ND filter um, feature, it was actually more of something that was a gimmick to me at least, but it was actually a nice to have feature in here. So yeah. If you guys are actually taking it more seriously, then the ND filter will definitely help you out a lot and you can definitely get used to it. Just don't expect it to be as strong as, let's say, a dedicated ND filter that you buy from a shop and you know which ND you want and then just put it in front of the lens. But it will still get the job done for the most part, the built-in ND filter in this camera. So yeah, that's good. Um, moving on to the next point, which is the back of the camera. The back of the camera, it has a very nicely well-designed um, button layout. Everything is pretty much at your fingertips tips and even though everything is kind of like crammed together it doesn't feel crammed together because like there's a nice tactile feeling to it the only complaint I have is pretty much these buttons right here the record button as well as the um, the S button right here uh, I'm sure there's a technical name for it but I just keep on calling it the S button because there is the um, the S sign right there. It is a little bit flush in and I just wish that it would be a bit um, flushed out a little bit simply because all of the other buttons are kind of flushing out and you know it's just creating that different um, feeling to the button that it's not really part of the same camera if that makes sense but yeah anyway but otherwise all of the buttons are really nicely laid out in a really logical place and just like 
uh, typical Canon when you do access the menu. All the menu settings and everything are also very logically arranged and efficiently organized as well. So you can actually access a lot of features and functions very easily and also quickly so you don't really miss a lot of shots. The only time when you might be missing certain shots is maybe it's just me coming from the DSLR and the mirrorless background is that, you know, after you focus, you can actually take the picture right away. Whereas with this camera, after you focus, there is that almost half a second wait when you can actually, you know, take a picture. So a lot of times I would be focusing and then um, pressing down on the shutter and then it would actually be half a second later or actually almost half a second later when the picture would be captured. So, you know, compare that to the uh, instant speed of the mirrorless cameras or the DSLRs that I usually talk about. You know, this feels a little bit slow and sluggish. So I just wish that, you know, it would be a little bit faster. But otherwise, everything just operates very nicely. All the buttons are very um, nicely designed and, you know, it's all just, yeah, it all just works. and. I really like how all the dials and all the uh, levers, they have a certain um, resistance to it, but not too much that it's not uncomfortable. You know, it's, it's all very natural, but in the same time, you won't really accidentally knock them. So that's actually very good. And also up here, it's hidden, but you can actually just pull the uh, lever here and the flash will pop up. So that's actually quite nice. Um, it's not a very powerful flash though, but it's actually nice that it's a bit further away from the lens and a bit higher as well because physically, well, yeah, physically, um, if the flash is a bit further and higher away from the lens, it actually helps to reduce uh, red eye effect when, actually, when you're actually taking portrait pictures. And of course, you can actually correct that later in post, but in the same time, you know, having this design actually already helps to eliminate that a little bit of a problem. So yeah. Now moving on to the side, this camera actually has all the essential ports that I, to be honest, don't really use. The only thing I feel jealous is the HDMI port. It's a much bigger HDMI port than the one I get on, let's say, my R5 and R6. So I wish that this port would actually make it on my R5 and R6 as well. But otherwise, there's the standard remote port, there's the standard USB port, which is nice. And onto the bottom of the camera, you'd find your typical battery that you actually um, share. Well, this battery series is actually shared with all the other G15, G12, G10, G11 cameras, things like that. So it's also nice. Oh, and you also have the yeah, SD card slot at the bottom here. So if you're using a tripod, it's going to be quite inconvenient because the tripod mount is not in the center, but just like right next to the uh, battery door. Um, so yeah, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. And then moving on to the next point, which is the ISO range. I really love the ISO range on this camera because it goes between ISO 80 all the way to 12,800. Now, I'm not crazy about um, the higher ISO. I'm just really liking the uh, ISO 80 simply because it really allows you to get the cleanest possible image out of this camera. Whereas with the uh, G1X, it started with the ISO 100, which I wish it would actually go down a bit more, like 80, 75, or 50. But no, it, start, it starts at ISO 100. Whereas with this camera, it starts at ISO 80, so that's actually quite nice. And also very beneficial, especially the sensor is a small sensor anyway. So using over ISO 800, you will start seeing noise into the image and the image would look a little bit less lively and also less vibrant. But if you have to push a little bit higher than ISO 800, then, you know, go ahead, you do you. I'm just saying that at least for my liking, I'm not going to be pushing it over ISO 800. In most cases, it will just be around ISO, well, between 80 and 400 because I find it it's a sweet spot for this particular camera. Of course, if you're shooting at night, then ISO 800 might even be too little and you might have to bump up to, let's say, ISO 1600 or ISO 1000, things like that. So yeah, just, just watch out a little bit. But you know, for the uh, rest of the ISO range, like the 80 to 400, I would say it's very clean and you can definitely tweak the file quite a bit, especially if you shoot in RAW, which is something that this camera allows you to shoot in, which is, I really love this function so much because I always shoot in RAW and you can actually get quite a bit more out of the raw images as well. The sharpness still remains the same as in the JPEG uh, files, but in the same time, it just retains more information within the uh, image that you can actually tweak a little bit more and also just manipulate it a bit more if you're into manipulating images. I'm not too much crazy about it, but you know, I usually just like to adjust the contrast, the shadows, the highlights, things like that. And having the raw files really allows me to 
um, produce more or actually come up with a uh, cleaner end results that actually looks a bit more lively than what it actually comes out with. But of course it actually makes sense because usually raw files are very dull and very flat anyway. Whew. And now to the next point, if you for some reason don't want to use the screen in the back of the camera, you can always use the kind of the optical range finder here. It does zoom with the lens, but in the same time, it's not the exact image that you'll get because it's actually just looking through the uh, window in the front right here rather than looking through what the lens is seeing. So it's not an optical viewfinder and it's not um, an electronic viewfinder that you can actually see what you're gonna get as well. But you can really frame with this and also you can just you know see the zoom range with this uh, viewfinder as well, which is actually pretty neat as well. But if you just want to use the back screen the whole time then the screen is actually also quite nice to use the refresh rate is actually pretty good and also the brightness is bright enough for you to see in most scenarios there will be certain scenarios where you might find it a bit too reflective let's say if you're working in direct bright sunlight then it can be both reflective and also a little bit too dim to see but other than that in normal lighting condition you will be able to actually judge your exposure judge your lighting correctly and accurately out of this screen as well the refresh rate is also pretty good for the camera from that time period which is actually pretty nice and also yeah the screen will actually show proper exposure on this camera as well so you can actually judge the brightness the composition the detail of it actually quite nicely as well and also when you're actually zooming to the images and checking the images on here the processor in here actually works fast enough so that you're not waiting like some other compact cameras from that time period or even older that you have to wait maybe half a second or a little bit um, less than half a second for the uh, image to load and zoom together with uh, your command. Whereas with this one, you can always zoom in and really just operate it right away, move to a different part of the image, and it will just, you know, be very responsive. So that's actually quite good. And then moving on to the front of the camera for a little bit, there's this ring in front of the uh, lens or actually around the lens itself where you can actually press this button right here and you can add as other accessories on here. Like if you want to have one of those um, fancy um, shutter closing lens or kind of um, lens protector or or one of those ultra wide angle lens that you can actually adapt to. So you can actually, you know, buy those accessories and just mount it on here. And I'm sure there are a lot of other third party accessories that are actually available for this particular camera as well, because it's not the first one. Um, the G12 also has it, the G11 also has it and also definitely the G15 also has the uh, feature as well. So there are already a lot of other optional accessories that you can actually find for this particular camera out there that would actually mount in front of the lens. So you can go and actually explore what there is to, you know, be discovered. <laughs> And now I would like to actually talk about the image quality out of this camera. The image quality out of this camera is actually quite nice. It's actually pretty clean, especially if you use it between ISO 80 and 400. Of course, above 800, you will start seeing a lot of noise coming in, so I wouldn't recommend that. But in the same time, if you stick with the more basic ISO range, then the image is actually very lively, very vibrant. There's a very natural rendition between different color tones, and it will actually give you that um, compact camera kind of um, color signs or color tones or look that a lot of people are slowly getting into nowadays because compact cameras nowadays seems to be like a retro thing, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm not using it as like a retro kind of style compact camera for me. I just really love how it renders different tones, different color signs, things like that. Of course, don't take it too seriously because with such a small sensor from, you know, almost a decade ago, uh, the dynamic range isn't really that good either, even though you can shoot in raw but the dynamic range suffers a little bit because of that smaller older technology sensor but in terms of the color reproduction color signs you know it's still a very nice Canon color signs that you'll get out of this compact camera albeit it's not gonna be the same color signs as you find on Canon's um, you know mirrorless cameras or DSLRs but it's a very nice Canon color signs in this compact camera as well the contrast is actually there it's very punchy and it's not too punchy that it looks unnatural but just punchy enough so that's also something that I really love about this uh, image quality out of this camera as well it's very nice but the only time that you might run into problems with the image quality on this camera is well when you're shooting anything with a lot of fine patterns like houses with really fine patterns of bricks things like that there will be like a lot of moray and aliasing just prepare for that and you just have to be careful with that but if you're not photographing a lot of fine patterns like one of those really 
um, precise straight lines and there are many of them on like fabrics, things like that, then you know, this camera is definitely a very good camera that actually still delivers really great results, especially when you can actually manually control your outcome as well because you get full manual settings with this camera. So yeah, it is a very nice little powerful camera to actually have in your hands and also in your pocket if your pockets are big enough for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, but of course in the same time if you're coming from compact cameras with you know bigger sensors or just coming from like let's say mirrorless cameras or DSLRs in general, you know, don't expect the image quality on this camera to be as sharp. It's not as sharp even like from the sensor wise, but it is just sharp enough for you to actually enjoy the results without you know pixel peeping things like that. But at the end of the day, this camera will still deliver really robust files so that you can actually do some really nice fine prints with it like A4, A3, A2 or even do some basic manipulation with the images. So that's actually quite nice as well. And having that said, let me actually lead into video quality. So in terms of the video quality, a lot of things what I said about the photography side of things can actually be applied to the video side of things as well. So the color science is still great, the roll-offs into the highlights and shadows is also still great. Where there are a lot of weaknesses in the uh, video side of things is the dynamic range. So yeah, because it doesn't allow you to actually shoot raw and the compression in video is actually um, quite compressed. So you can't really, you know, um, kind of pull back the highlights or pull back the shadows as much as you can with the raw files on the photography side of things. So just watch out what you're actually filming with this camera. If you're indoor and a lot of things are nicely controlled, then of course this camera will actually deliver really nice results. Or if you're in like a generally really nice lit environment, then this camera will still deliver really nice results as well. Although comparing the 1080p from back then to the 1080p from nowadays, of course the 1080p from back then does look a bit softer, so please don't judge it too much, but it is still a great camera. And also the autofocusing system in video works smooth enough. It will not always get everything right, but it will get a lot of things. When it gets it right, it's gonna be very smooth. But yeah, other negative things about the video side of things is, well, the problem with Moray and aliasing in photography, it's only gonna be more pronounced in video because of course it's gonna be more demanding on the processor, it's gonna be more demanding on the sensor itself, but it is definitely manageable. And you know, at this point, you're not really gonna be caring too much about the Moray and aliasing out of this camera anyway. But of course, at the end of the day, you can actually come up with really nice results in terms of video quality out of this camera if you know how to use it properly. If you're just doing a bit of snippets here, snippets there, then you know, your iPhone will definitely do a much better job. Actually, talking about iPhones, they will actually be able to deliver more solid results in video mode than this camera can because everything is computational in those phones already. So with this camera, you just have to do everything manually. And of course, the computational photography in this particular camera is not that great. But then again, it's a completely different price range between the iPhone, let's say the iPhone 12, 13, 14, versus this camera, which is like under 100 euros at this point. So yeah, just keep that in mind. That being said, if you're into like an older digital compact look and vibe and you still want to get at least 1080p out of it, then you know this camera is another camera to really take a look at because it does have that old digital compact camera vibe to it when you're actually filming with this camera and also it does it at 1080p and should you wish to do so, it does it at 60 frames per second as well in 1080p. Whew. So yeah, that's actually pretty great. So now let me actually lead into the conclusion. To conclude, this camera has been a very enjoyable camera for me to use. It's been very fun to use. It's very capable. It's a very nice and tough camera as well. And I've been traveling a lot with this camera as well to the point where even though it was brand new when I got it, but you know, the screen is actually, there's a crack right there and um, I'm never really easy on my gear as you can probably um, notice from many of my videos, whether it's on DSLRs, on my photo shoots, things like that. I drop my gear. I, I'm not easy on them, I just, you know, throw them into the bag and then expect them to be fine, things like that. And this camera survived a lot and it just kind of proved to me on um, the uh, build quality of this camera that even though it's, you know, plastic here and there, but it is a very nice and tough camera that is willing to actually go to many places that actually take it to. And also I don't really have to care too much about this camera. Of course it's not weather sealed, so that's something that you might have to actually watch out for and don't shoot too much in the rain. I only shoot sometimes in like light drizzle, but yeah, that's it for that. But in the same time, it is able to handle light drizzle, although I don't condone that because it's not officially a weather sealed camera. But 
I did it anyway and it actually still survives so <laughs> take it for what it is but in the same time it is also a very responsive camera the only downside is of course as I mentioned earlier if you're used to coming from the uh, DSLR or mirrorless cameras it's not always as um, responsive when it comes to you know after focusing and then taking the picture it has that like half a second or like not even half a second just almost half a second kind of delay to it um, just like how pretty much most of the other compact cameras also have but in the same time if you're coming from like say DSLRs and also mirrorless cameras it can be a little bit frustrating because you know after pressing half and the focus confirms you can just take pictures that instant Whereas this one, you have to wait a little bit. But otherwise, I really love how the control layout are pretty much at your fingertips. And I really love this, you know, um, exposure compensation um, dial up here, which is actually pretty great. The battery life on this camera is also pretty good. Of course, it's not big, but in the same time, this camera doesn't really require a lot of um, power. So you can actually go through one battery for like a few days of shooting. So that's actually pretty great. Unless if you actually shoot a lot of videos, that's when um, it becomes a little bit more tricky because video Video will actually consume a lot of battery as well but in the same time even if you shoot a lot of videos uh, you will still be able to go through quite a bit of video shoots with just one battery that being said I do recommend getting at least two or three other batteries and it shouldn't be that hard because to be honest you can still find this battery brand new or at least from third parties anyway because this battery is still very common since a lot of this model of cameras were made and there is still demand for this particular battery for all the other uh, models that Canon produced that supports this battery or actually takes this battery. So yeah, this camera is also very fast to operate as I mentioned earlier but also in terms of like the frames per second because you can really do a lot of creative things with the frames per second. Albeit just watch out on what you shoot simply because the autofocusing system might not always be able to keep up. But yeah, if you know what you're going to be doing with the frames per second, then you can really do something creative with it. And also this Wi-Fi feature, of course, the downside about the Wi-Fi feature is that it doesn't allow you to actually tether shoot, which is too bad. But in the same time, you can actually just download the images wirelessly through the app onto your phone and then just, you know, give it to your friends, like send your images to your friends, family or whoever it may concern, things like that, or just share on your social media right away. So that's actually pretty nice as well. You don't always have to wait until your home or you know put the card into the uh, card reader of your iPad or tablets or your other smartphone devices and then just you know go through the hassle of downloading and then just um, edit from the card and things like that you can just transfer the images from the camera to the phone right away even with the raw file as well assuming your phone also supports the raw um, but otherwise of course the app will naturally convert from raw to JPEG for you and the Canon app the wireless app is actually very fast and efficient so you don't actually have to wait a long time for uh, the connection to transfer the images Whew. so yeah and also find that the lens focal length is also quite useful 28 to 140 millimeter 35 millimeter um, full frame equivalent so it's actually from kind of like standard wide to a little bit of telephoto so that's actually quite nice I do wish that the lens would actually go all the way out to 24 millimeter but in the same time you can't always wish a lot of things especially this wasn't really their high-end compact camera anyway so yeah overall I still recommend this camera you know you can get it for like under 100 euros nowadays well give or take depending on the region of the world that you live in but you know, this compact camera is still a very small and powerful compact camera that allows you to actually have that full manual control as well. And you can actually experiment with so many different features and so many settings on this camera. And with the benefit, if you're into like, you know, using the um, camera with the older digital look, especially the older digital compact camera look, then this camera is still a nice camera that will give you really robust file, yet still giving you that older digital compact camera look that you can actually manipulate a little bit as well. So yeah, it's, it's a really great camera. It is very versatile. The lens range is also quite kind of versatile. There are some flaws here and there, but overall, it's a very nice, tough camera that you should actually consider if you want to get into like a cheap, compact camera world that actually still delivers some really nice results and also actually allows you to have some of the more manual control over the system as well. Whew. So yeah, there is that. Um, 
I know that there are so many other features of this camera that I haven't covered, but in the same time, I just wanted to share some of my opinion on this camera based on how I use it. And to be honest, I really love using this camera. The IS on this camera is also very nice. It's very stable, especially if you zoom in, you don't see a lot of shakiness, which is nice. So you can actually um, perform some a little bit of long exposure photography with handheld, but not too long. I wouldn't recommend over a second, at least with my particular shaky hands, at least. But uh, yeah. Before this video gets any much longer and before I start diving off or going off the road um, I would like to actually end it here. If you need a free photography guidebook, it's absolutely for free for beginners It's on my website. Just you know click the link down in the description section below on my website Just click and download without you know submitting your email address. You don't have to submit anything I will not bombard you with any newsletter nonsense. So yeah, thank you all very much for watching If you have any questions any suggestions feel free to leave them down in the uh, comment section below I'll do my best to get to them. Otherwise, I wish you all a great time. Stay safe, have fun shooting. Till next time, bye for now.